moment of special privilege. The backbone of Asbury First over the years have been a group of people who have come together in church school classes. They've nourished, they've nurtured each other. They have been there in the joyous times for each other and in the times of concern and prayerful thought. One of those classes, and there are many, is celebrating their 64 years together, so it's really their 65th year. And so I would invite the partnership class who is sitting together, and as they sit together, they really have a metaphor for what it is to live together, guided by the light of Christ, and celebrating and loving each other. So would you stand that we might recognize the fellowship of Christ that has been with you and will continue to be with you. And we thank you this day for your faithfulness to this church and your faithfulness to Christ. Let us recognize you by standing. May you have many, 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 many more years together. Will you pray with me? May the words of our mouths, O oh God, and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. For you, O oh God, are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. <coughs> Perhaps it is irony Perhaps it is happenstance, or perhaps it is Kairos time, that is Christ's time. However you might term it, it is at the very least interesting and fascinating that the week of our president's second inaugural address, amid the clarion calls of the trumpets playing Hail to the Chief, or Beyonce's singing of the Star Spangled Banner, or the, the inspired poet and poetic words of Richard Blanco painting the very essence of our lives with such descriptive poetic words. Perhaps the beauty of Kelly Clarkson's rendition of My Country Tis of Thee, or even President Obama's statement to find the good and praise it. Amid Monday's address, there is nestled in the Lucan Gospel a pericope, our lectionary gospel reading for, day, for today, that some would say is Jesus's inaugural address of his ministry and his mission. Ironic? Maybe. Happenstance, maybe. Random, just maybe. Revelation of God's mysterious ways, only if you have eyes to see it, ears to hear it, and a heart to enfold and embrace it. The podium today has not been erected in front of the Capitol building, no, Jesus has gone home to Nazareth, to the pulpit in the synagogue. This son of Joseph the carpenter and son of Mary has come home to his synagogue, and he is speaking to the hometown folk. And his word changes things dramatically. Jesus is setting forth his agenda, borrowing words from the prophet Isaiah, and as the scroll is unrolled, the crowd hears Jesus, that he has been anointed to do this, anointed to bring good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, 
to let the oppressed go free and proclaim God's jubilee year when debts are canceled and land is returned. Not everyone understood that day. Not everyone agreed that day. Not everyone trusted Jesus that it could be so. Nonetheless, Jesus immerses himself in scripture that allows him to be able to project a vision of hope. A vision. Jesus came and said, God has sent me. He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. There will be a time when the poor will hear the gospel, when the prisoners are released, when the captives are set free, when they who are spiritually and physically blind are able to see God's grace and God is proclaimed. This was the great vision that he posited before them and called them to hear what their lives could be. Jesus knew that there was a harsh and ruthless way of the way things were then. He could look around himself. He knew that they were in occupied territory. He knew that they, there were poor people, homeless people, and sick people everywhere. He knew that the taxes were sky high. He could see the Roman soldiers and he could see that the very worst of the lot was being given to the poor. Jesus knew the way things were and so do we when we open our eyes. What a great vision he had. What a challenge. We are not in Nazareth. We sit today in a city, a country, a world, yet our challenges are not unlike the challenges of Nazareth. There are hurts to heal. There are poor people here, homeless people here, there are lonely people here. There are the oppressed and captive people here. There are hurts, deep hurts, that need to be healed. And we might ask, what can I do? Is there anything I can do? Can I be the one who stands in the gap between the way things are and the way things can be? Can I bring a bridge over which other people can travel in that journey from the way things are to the way things could be? I am reminded of an apt bit of wisdom most often attributed to St. Francis of Assisi. Preach the gospel at all times, he said, and when necessary, use words. Isn't that the deeper meaning behind what Jesus said? Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. It is not a proclamation seeped in arrogance. It points to the enduring truth of one we call Savior and Lord, who he was and how he lived. And it is our intent to be more like, if it is our intent, to be more like Jesus, then we must make what Jesus said shape who we are and what we do. Sometimes we think we not, might not be capable of, capable of this or not capable of building for ourselves that kind of life, a life filled with meaning and purpose. Then we need to hear again these words spoken by Martin Luther King, Jr. Everybody can be great, he said, because anybody can serve. You don't have to have a college degree to serve. 
You don't have to make your subject and your verb agree to serve. You don't have to know the second theory of thermodynamics in physics, and it's a good thing, to serve. You only need a heart full of grace and a soul that generates love. If we look at the context of this passage in Luke, the biblical preacher, Reverend Charles Morris, has written that we each need to remember the progression of this story of Jesus. This passage is nestled in the third in a series of events as Luke presents it. Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist, Secondly, Jesus was driven into the wilderness where he was tempted by Satan. Both events establish the essential connection between God and God's people. For Jesus, baptism was not an end, it was a beginning. And then Jesus, as he is driven into the wilderness, realizes he must choose between ways of living. No less than you and I need to choose between ways of living. We need to choose a way of living that honors God in Christ. Baptism for each of us, like Jesus, connects us to God. Not to make our lives carefree, but to enrich them with God's Spirit and empower us to choose grace rather than judgment, engagement rather than indifference, and forgiveness rather than revenge. And note what happened when that 40-day trip in the wilderness ended. Where did Jesus go? Filled with the Spirit, Jesus went back to Nazareth. He went home. Might that not say something to us that is important? It was not so much a geographical destination as it was a destination of the Spirit, a necessary reminder that we can and must live into the gospel message where we are today, at this very moment, in whatever place God calls us to be. And it doesn't matter how big or tiny your world may seem, how many people you know, or whether your place of work is large or small, the way Jesus lived should cause us to proclaim the gospel with few words and lots of love, right where we are. In Jesus Christ, the spiritual home for God's people is no longer a geographical location. It is the very presence of Jesus dwelling in our hearts, in the hearts of all who trust in him and decide to follow him. I can tell you about a man who came to work in a church as a financial person. His work was described as record keeping, financial planning, budgeting, and all the rest that goes along with that. Yet what this man discovered when he was touched deeply by the Spirit of God was that he was inspired to more than numbers. He was inspired to new ideas about stewardship, new approaches to stewardship, encountering the Christ in others and in himself, began to emerge indeed. He discovered he was anointed and he was filled and his life was in and empowered by gift-giving. 
I can tell you about a family discovering their mission. Together and as individuals, they believed they were called to mission in Nicaragua. Their lives given unto Christ have begun to make a tremendous difference in a small settlement. Their love and Christ's love have bonded together in such a way that others know and see and feel the living Christ among them. Another. Way back in 1835, a man named Elijah saw a man lynched. It changed his life. He cut back on his career as a Presbyterian minister and as a school teacher. He went back to his earlier training as a newspaper editor and began to write anti-slavery tracts. He delivered speeches, and yes, he aroused hostility. People persecuted him, beat him, and finally burned him out of his house. He was injured in combating the fire, and after only two years, he was killed. Elijah P. Lovejoy, a life cut short. Yet a young attorney in Elijah's home state of Illinois read Elijah P. Lovejoy's materials and was deeply influenced. And 26 years later, Lovejoy's faithful life impacted that young attorney who then signed the Emancipation Proclamation. You know him. One person, one individual, one attorney, one family, one community of God. When we listen again to Jesus' words in the temple that day, I wonder if we hear those words and forget to hear them as our call as well. Jesus teaches us that we must be grasped by something larger than ourselves. The opening scene of Jesus' public ministry left no doubt. A commitment to Jesus involves a commitment to build communities of equality, grace, peace, and justice. The text, then, is about both calling and task for you as well as for me. It is about having been anointed and the priority of being filled by the Spirit. Those who speak out must be able to report this. I cannot refrain from doing this. I am anointed by, pushed by, filled by, inspired by one Jesus Christ, who will not let me express my faithfulness in any other way. Perhaps, my friends, your words, your living, your faith will call you again to live the words of Jesus. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me to bring good news, to proclaim release, to liberate the oppressed, and to proclaim the year of our Lord's favor. And just maybe today, yes, just maybe today, this scripture will begin to be fulfilled in our hearing. We can be that kind of individual and that kind of community of God who embody the promise as did Jesus. We must simply find something that we like to do and do it.
Find something we do well and do it for the glory of God in Christ. One single person, one individual, one congregation, one group of beloved people can make the difference, my friends. You see, God-sized blessings, it has been said, always come with a God-sized mission. We have been blessed and we have been given a God-sized mission. It is before us all. So know you are anointed. Know you can be filled with that Holy Spirit. And as you know and as you are, go into the world and let Jesus Christ's mission and ministry be your impetus and your guide. Amen.